Say hello. Welcome them into the house of the Lord right now. As you find your seats, I just want to remind you that we just started our small groups last week. Anybody in here in a small group? Got three people in a small group. Anybody else? Anybody else in a small group? Give me a woo woo. Okay, more than three people. Awesome. If you have not gotten involved, please look at our small groups. You can find it on the app. You can find it on our website. Talk to a small group leader. Talk to Pastor Jonathan. Okay. Talk to Pastor Magdalena. That is a mouthful, okay? Pastor Magdalena. Um, they know all about it, and they know where it would be a good place for you to get plugged in. So please speak to somebody that's in charge and, and find your place because we are having a good time in small groups, and I don't want you to miss out. Okay? And then uh, just, uh, you know, we try to plug one every single week. But I know there's one time of the week where you might not be busy, and it's at what time on Tuesday morning? 6 a.m. Oh, yeah. The ones that go, no. <laughs> 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning, we have prayer. I tell you what, it changes things. Coming and taking that time and setting it aside in your life, it changes things within you. So if you haven't come, come and join us on Tuesday mornings, 6 a.m. That's just one of the small groups that we have going on weekly. So please get involved somewhere. We would love to see you involved. And I just want to say I'm glad my dad is back in town. How about your mom? Well, my mom too. Of course. Yeah. We're, we're in worship, and I hear her organ over there, and I'm like, oh, yes. You're glad I brought her back with me? <laughs> yes, I'm glad you brought her that back. I didn't leave her in Connecticut. <laughs> so give them a welcome, guys. We are so glad you are back. It's been a long, long month without you. <laughs> but we are glad to be home. We are glad to be home. You know, we were gone for four weeks, four Sundays. We were in three different churches. We did miss one Sunday driving, but three different churches. And the Spirit of the Lord was in those three churches, but it's not, there's no place like home. And we really enjoy being with you this morning. I enjoy the, the presence of God that was here today. Uh, I'm so thankful for our lead team that did so well while we were gone, kept things together, and the support staff that worked with them so well. We do appreciate that. I, um, I, I want to throw something kind of out to you right now at, at the beginning. Some of you heard um, a, a foreign language being spoken and then somebody speaking out uh, in, in a very forceful, commanding voice. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and ch chapter 14, you're talking about the gifts of the Spirit in operation, all right, tongues and interpretation. When God, sometimes when he wants to speak to a congregation, he'll use somebody to speak out of, uh, give out a message that will be in uh, what sounds like a foreign language, and then somebody will bring the interpretation. This is something that has happened spontaneously in the church for the past 2,000 years, and it's something that's very much a part of, what, of church life. We, we haven't experienced that a lot around here um, for various reasons. And there's nothing one way or the other. There's not a right or wrong. I'm just a, but the Lord did. He spoke to us a word that you need to get. He gave us two words that I want everybody to hold on to. He said, gather in. Gather in. If you heard nothing else, hear those two words. Because the day that we're in outside these doors require an attendance in our heart to make sure that we are coming together and we're gathering in. You cannot make it in this end time. You can't make it by yourself. We need each other, and we need each other more today than ever before. So there needs to be inside our hearts and minds uh, the understanding that this was the Lord reinforcing what he's already said in his word. You know, he says that gather, come together. We're supposed to, to come together as God's people, and even the more so as we see the day approaching. How many of you know that we're seeing the day approaching? Yes. Oh, yeah. The day is approaching, and we've got to be ready for it. 
We've got to be ready for it. So, again, we're glad to be home, glad that you're here, glad to have our guests with us today, and we hope to meet you after church if we haven't met you before. Uh, for all of you that uh, have been praying for us, we do appreciate your prayers. You know, uh, it was 4,960 mi miles that we drove, and um, <clears throat> when we got here and I looked at the speedometer, I thought about driving around Albuquerque 40 more miles <laughs> just so I could come here and tell you we actually drove 5,000 miles. But 4,960 miles was enough. It was enough. That was a long way up to Connecticut and all the way back. And we thank the Lord for, for his protection. Amen. For his protection. The Lord was good to us all the way. We saw the only short, close call we had was in New York City. We happened in our way to Connecticut. I don't know why it worked this way, but we were in New York City at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, this one guy felt like the back side of his car was supposed to meet, have a fellowship meeting with the front side of our car, and it was about a matter of that much dif dif difference. The thing that he didn't know was that my companion knows how to cry out Jesus. And when, he, when she cries out Jesus, I don't care what kind of car is up here, how much it weighs and who the driver is, that car is going to get out of the way. And it did. It just took a, it took a right turn, a left turn, whatever it was, and I'm going, <laughs> That is true. If you didn't hear that, she said, in the first time in 52 years, she grabbed me. She did. She, <laughs> she's crying out, Jesus, she grabs my arm, and then she says, the first time in 52 years, because tomorrow is our wedding anniversary of 52 years. Yes. <laughs> and how blessed I am, how blessed I am to have a wonderful, godly, loving, forgiving companion that uh, brings so much to my life, so much to the life of our children and to the churches that we have pastored in the, these years. And, and again, thank you for all of your prayers. We felt, we really felt the, the strength of your prayers while we were gone, and the Lord helped us in a lot, of, a lot of different ways. We were able to preach for our oldest son, Kevin, who pastors in Connecticut, and he's doing such a marvelous work up there. If he's watching right now, son, we're proud of you. We're really proud of you. Just proud of the work that you've done there. And so thankful that we could be a part of what you were doing. And uh, we hope that we can do that again sometime soon. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's get into this this morning. Because we've been on a journey, okay? The Sermon on the Mount is becoming increasingly more important in my mind and heart in wanting to bring to you the things that are in there. Almost all of us are, to some degree, a spirit-filled person. You're Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled. I don't care what label you are. If God has baptized you in the spirit, then you're part of his body. You know, okay, you've received that. And, and we want to read through the book of Acts, and we want to see what the apostles did in the book of Acts. But all of that, what he did in establishing the churches, was built on the foundation of how he was going to establish his church. Now, you have to understand, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was not a Christian. He was a Jew. So that when he started gathering people together at age 30, and he put them on a hillside, he's about to start a three-and-a-half-year time period of, of ministry. Only he has three-and-a-half years to get in place the foundation of a, of a movement, a new, new religious movement. Now, you're talking about 4,000 years of these people, Jewish nation, coming together, and they've got 613 laws and regulations, and they've got the Pharisees that are watching down on every one of them, making sure they do everything just right, okay? And he takes those people, and he puts a, a crowd of them on a hillside, and he started, he's, he's going to start talking to them about, this is the way, we're going to change things up now. It's no longer are we going to live the way that you, we've been living before. Now it's going to be a whole new. We want to take this as a foundation, but we're going to look at, and have a whole new approach to this thing called God. Now, what is he going to say? Well, it's that Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. The most famous sermon, the most power-packed sermon that you have in the Bible, all compressed together. Now, in that, you have what's called the Beatitudes, all right? The Bible says in the first and second verse, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. When he was set, his, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now, at that very point, we have to understand, here's the Lord. What is he going to say? What is he going to bring? What is going to be the order of importance of what he's going to bring to them? 
So a few weeks ago, before we, before we left, I brought you the first message that was on blessed are the poor in spirit for those of the kingdom of God. And over the past few weeks, we've been working through the Beatitudes. Today, we read together now, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Everybody say, I want to be a peacemaker. I want you to be a peacemaker. I want you to be a peacemaker. Lord Jesus, I ask by your spirit, Lord, that you come. Touch our hearts, Lord God. Warm our hearts. Open up our hearts, God, for the planting of the seed of your word so that we can be transformed in our minds, Lord Jesus. We need to become more like you and more today than ever before. And Lord, we, we put ourselves on the potter's wheel right now and saying, God, do your work. Do a work inside each and every one of us. It's going to be different, Lord, for all of us, but whatever it is, help us to walk out of here changed, that your word has brought change into our, into our lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. You know, so he, now the Lord focuses on peacemakers, and, and peace is important. I think that if you, in a day that we're living right now, if you could bottle, somehow bottle up peace and put a label on it and walk down to Mar Target or Walmart or somewhere like that, you, the, the shelves would be empty. Peace would, would, people would buy bottles of peace if that's all they could. If that's the easiest way to get peace would be to pop the top off something and, and pour it out or dump it out or whatever it might be. Peace is important. We want peace. Some of you have come in here today needing a measure of peace inside your life. Well, the three songs that we sung today have brought us to a place where God can now plant seeds inside of us to help us to understand the journey of what it is to come into peace, to come into the peace that God has. See, the Lord has showed us the importance of peace in Scripture. Peace is used 91 times in the New Testament, 24 times in the Gospels. Paul, Paul starts most of his letters writing to people or to churches by saying, grace be to you and peace. He talks about grace. He talks about peace, all right? He's, he's talking about these things very, very important. Isaiah 9 and 6 says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. So the one that we received into our lives when God baptized you in his spirit, he who lives inside of us is the prince of peace. So if you're walking with God right now and you have the spirit of God in you, you already have the starting point, the foundation of all the peace that you're ever going to need in your walk with him. It's just a matter of us understanding that peace and understanding how to attain that, how to grab a hold of it. Uh, the Apostle Peter told, tells us in his, in his uh, Gospels to, to seek peace and to pursue it, to pursue peace. That's why we're here today. King David said, great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing shall cause them to stumble. You see, I, I don't know if the Beatitudes are, pre are presented in order of importance. One day we can get to heaven, we can ask the Lord about that. But if you were Jesus and you wanted to present to people what were the, the, the most important characteristics about this new, new relationship with this new relationship called, uh, this new religion called Christianity, what would, you, what would be the things that would, you would bring to them? What would, would be the things you would highlight and say, these are the things that are important? I already talked about the poor in spirit. I believe that poor in spirit opens the door to the whole Sermon on the Mount. I believe poor in spirit opens up the door to the, the power of all the other Beatitudes. See, Pastor Jonathan came the next week and talked about mourning. And he talked about meek, being meek in, in the Lord. And he said, meekness is not weakness. What a wonderful job he did with that message. Now, but the reason the church doesn't mourn is because we really don't think we're poor in spirit. You say, oh, that's offensive, Pastor. Good. I'm going to try to offend you the best I can, all right, with a smile on my face, and I want you to receive it with a smile on your face, all right, because I'm here to love you enough, to care about you enough, to tell you the truth. He says, blessed are they that mourn. The only time we mourn is when we get hurt. That wasn't the mourning he was talking about. He says we ought to mourn in the fact of the world that we're in right now. We ought to mourn about the loved ones that we have around us that are lost 
We need to mourn about our neighbors and our coworkers. There ought to be a mourning where we're uh, with a grief inside our heart about this the kind of the, the catastrophe of the world around us and what kind of world is coming to our children and our grandchildren. We ought to mourn about those things, but we don't. We don't because we're too busy with our lives, and we're too busy with our lives because we think we've got it all together that we don't need Him. Poor in spirit means we need Him. Bottom line. Everything that you are, everything that you have, everything that you can do is based on poor in spirit. And then coming out of mourning and making is what? Then Pastor, Pastor Greg came and did a wonderful job in presenting to you what it is to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We hunger and thirst after a lot of good things, but lots of times not after righteousness. We need that. The next week, Pastor Jason came back and, he, and Pastor Jason talked to us about being merciful and one of the reasons, again, one of the reasons we, 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 we judge people and we're critical of people and we get mad at people, all these things, is because we don't have mercy inside our hearts. Why? Well, because we're not poor in spirit. We've got it all together. We think everybody else has got their problems and we don't have problems. We all have problems because you have had this flesh right here. We all have this stuff right here and we need God to help us with this. And he talked about that the only, I need mercy, church. You need mercy? Jesus said, if you need mercy, you've got to be merciful to get that mercy. Amen? I want to be a merciful person. I really want to be a merciful person. And then the next week, Pastor J Jason came back with Pastor Jonathan. What a wonderful job. They're, they're, they're coming to you, and they're, they're bringing all these, these wonderful things to the Lord about being pure in heart. And capped it off last week with communion. We wish we had been here with you at a communion service. But all of these things are leading up to what now? Peacemakers. Peacemakers. Today we come to peacemakers, not peacekeepers. There's a difference. Just keeping peace, okay. I think we ought to do that. We're going to talk about that. But he didn't say peacekeepers. He said peacemakers. There's a mentality shift inside your mind. There's an intentionality about being a peacemaker that elevates you above over just the, just the, the general day-by-day -day thing, yeah, we ought to keep peace. That's just a good thing to do. Peacemakers is a better thing to do. Peacemakers is what God wants us to do, to be a peacemaker, and that's what we're going to work on today. I'll give you this statement that we're going to follow through over and over in this message is peacemakers have no problem being peacekeepers. Peacemakers have no problem with that. Now, here's the problem with peace. We all say, well, yeah, but Pastor, I, it's, no, no, I got this, this peace thing, thing down. And, you know, I have to work on it here and there. We all have a problem with, about peace because of the way that we're made. You see, the, the issue, like well, I talked about the, the gifts of the Spirit that went forth this morning in the, in the message, tongues and interpretation. Those are gifts of the Spirit found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. A gift is something that God gives us, like the gift of the, the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's a gift from God. He gifts us the, His Spirit inside our lives. That's a wonderful thing. Peace is not a gift from God. We can have peace, all right, and there is a measure of peace that we get anyhow, but when you go to Galatians chapter 5, there's the fruit of the Spirit, and the Lord says, love, joy, and peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those are nine fruit of the Spirit that are in Galatians chapter 5. Gifts are given by God. Fruit is something that is grown. Everybody say, fruit is grown. Fruit is grown. It's something that we have to understand that I have a responsibility inside my heart and my relationship with God. I have to have an intentionality uh, that I want to grow this, this, this fruit of peace inside my life. I want to make sure that I'm a more peace, at peace with God and more at peace with my world. Going down the world, I'm going after being more of a peacemaker today than ever before. I want to work on that. I want to make that part of my agenda of life. So you see, how are we going to develop this heart of a peacemaker? We have to make peace with the Lord. For all of you here today, maybe you've been raised around church and you call yourself a Christian and that, you know, I'm glad for all the accept, believe, confess, receive, all these things. You prayed the sinner's prayer, all those things. I'm, I don't want to take anything away from any of that. What I want to know is right now, is, the, is he the Lord of your life? Does he call the shots? 
Is his spirit inside your life? Do you feel convicted? Well, if, you're, if your lips slip and you, you use the Lord's name in vain, does something grab you and say, man, I can't be doing that? When you start straying from things that are, that are wrong, you, you, you can't lay out a church. If it's on Sunday morning, well, I'm, I'm there. If, if, my church is, if, if, if my church is gathering in, I'm gathering in with them. That's what the Lord told us to do. Gather in. So when we have a, something going on, even, even in small group ministry, is a form of gathering in. It's on a smaller dimension, but we're supposed to gather in. Why? Because we need each other. I need you. You need me. We need each other. There's a gathering in in all of this. And, 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 and somehow when God's spirit gets inside our lives, we, we cannot do anything except want to be everything that he wants us to be. So we have to, but we have to make peace with him. And, and the apostle Paul defines what our real problem is. Now listen to this. And this applies to every one of us, even as we are here right now. For we know the law is spiritual. I'm a carnal soul in the sin. I am carnal. Ever say I'm carnal? We're carnal. Hey, if the Apostle Paul called himself carnal, we're carnal, okay? He says, I'm carnal, but what I'm doing, I don't understand. How many of you ever said, why did I do that? You ever said that? I know better than that. Why am I doing that? Well, the Apostle Paul just said that. What I'm doing, I don't understand. For what I want to do, I don't practice it, and the things that I hate, I do. How many can say amen to that? Amen. 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 I'm there, all right? If then I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it's good, but now it's no longer I who do it, but sin dwells in me. How many of you have sin dwelling in you right now? Everybody, I'm going to close my eyes. Everybody raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to open my eyes. Thank you very much. I appreciate you being honest. Oh, but I, I walk with God. I've been baptized in Jesus' name. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues. Great. Sin dwells in you. Well, I don't want sin to dwell in you. Be careful. You say that too often. The Lord says, okay, well, I'll take you to heaven. Because the only way you're going to get sin not dwelling in you is when you draw your last breath. You will always have that fight in you, the fight that he's talking about right here. He says, look, look, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells in there. Nothing good dwells in there. To make my mind up to do the right things, it's present with me. But how to perform that which, is, which I'm, uh, what is good, I don't find. For the good that I want to do, I don't do it. The evil that I don't want to do, that's what I practice. Now listen, this is the reason that Paul is setting up the, the, the challenge that all of us have about this thing called peace. This thing called peace. Now if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who do it, the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see, now look, this, this is so important, verse 23, but I see another, another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. In other words, you have this thing in you, you're at war. Your mind is saying, don't do that, and you do it anyhow. Your mind says, that's the, I hate doing that kind of stuff. How many of you keep doing the same thing you hate? Okay, I'm close. do I have to close my eyes again? <laughs> we do. We do. And you catch, catch yourself, what, what's this all going on? It brings, I, I have this warning against my mind and, and brings me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. You can't preach this me message in, in Christian television today. You can't get on this message and say, oh, all, all you Christians out there, you're just a bunch of wretched people. Well, click. Come on. And what, what the click goes off, then the support doesn't come on, right? It, it's not a popular message, but we're wretched people. If the Apostle Paul called himself a wretched man after what he had all done, I think we're way back on this side of it, and I'm a wretched person. I call myself a wretched person. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the, 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 basically, the gospel is this, that when God created you, he gave you, he put inside you, Two things. One was, from Adam and Eve, this desire to do our own thing, which is sin. But he also gave you the power of choice. All right? You come into this world, and you're either going to go to heaven or go to hell based on the choices that you make. All right? That's just what it is. But the Lord says, even though I created you this way, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to become flesh. I'm going to be born of a baby, as a baby, in, in a manger. And I'm going to live for 30 years Submitted to a father and mother, I'm going 
I'm going to preach for three and a half years. I'm going to let my own creation crucify me. And they're going to, they're going to bury me in a tomb. And then on the third day, I'm going to, not, not, not three days later, on the third day, there's a difference there. On the third day, I'm going to rise from that tomb, showing you that you, if you have me inside of you, you have the power of, of, over life, over death, hell, and the grave. That is the issue that we have today. That is God working inside us. So uh, here's the thing. If you have faith inside your heart and life that the Lord did that for you, and you put your faith in the Lord based on that, then we, we move past. I want, to catch, I want you to catch this. It's very important. We move past what I'm doing as the basis of why I, 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 I'm okay with the Lord. No, you're okay with the Lord based on your faith. You put your faith in Him. Now, you're doing things because of that faith. This is important because, you know, I was in a, a, a day service of a camp meeting one time, and the main speaker said, therefore, having justified, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. There's a lot of Christian people that don't have peace with God because they think they're justified, they're made, being made right with God based on the things that they do. Well, I don't do this, and I don't do that. I don't go here, I don't go there. I don't I'm glad for all of that. I mean, work on all of that. But we are justified by faith. And when you understand that, when you boil it all down, that as my faith in God, then that gives me a measure of peace. Paul said it. It gives me a measure of peace, and I need that inside my life. Because when I go out into this world and I'm commissioned, commissioned by the Lord, mandated by God to be a peacemaker, I cannot give to my world what I don't have. And I don't care if your label is whatever Christian label you want to put on yourself. It's what you have there on the inside of you. I can stand up here and, and give you a 30-hour 30 uh, 30, 30 uh, lecture on measles, okay? Tell you about all kinds of measles. But I've got a, if I've got a raging thing of mumps inside me, you come up afterwards and shake my hand, you're going to get mumps. I've talked about measles, but you're going to get what I've got in me. And Christian people don't have peace. We don't have peace. We're not justified by peace. We're justified by the label that we are. Well, I was raised this and I was raised that. I am so tired of asking people, are, are you a follower of Christ? Well, yes, I'm a... And they give me a label. Stop the labels. I'm tired of labels. I don't care what that label is. That label means nothing. I can take your label back far enough to the Reformation and show you that that label came out of a refora Reformation that was in so total, total darkness... That this, it, we're, we're, we're lucky that anybody came out of that thing alive. The Catholic Church had had the, 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 that had the Christianity form for 1,200 years. And now, here comes Christianity and labels. No. I want to know, do you have your faith in Jesus? Do you have your faith in Jesus? So important. That's your first step, to have peace with God, peace with the Lord. Okay? You cannot give to people what you do not have. Peacemakers have no problem. Peacemakers have no problem being peacekeepers. The second thing then, so what should be our, our mindset as a peace, peacemaker is to be reconciled with people. Now, and I'm going to get very, very, very raw with this right now. If you're sitting here today and you know inside your heart and mind that you have something like this going with anybody, with anybody, okay? Husband, wife, you like this? You this with your children? If we're like this with our, 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 our extended family, you got brothers and sisters that there's a big divide between you, or maybe your neighbors, your coworkers, whatever it is, but you've got this animosity going on, this thing is working like this. Come on, church, when you've got this stuff going on, hey, the, the Lord hasn't given us any free reign about that. He's been very clear about that. We're not supposed to be carrying anything inside our heart. You cannot be a peacemaker as long as you're carrying aught inside your heart, as long as you've got grievance inside your heart towards somebody. It doesn't work that way. What's, and, and so here's the Lord. He, like we come in here this morning and we're worshiping the Lord. And he says this. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar. In other words, if you come to Triumph Center on a certain day in October in the year 2023. And there remember that your brother has something against you. Your brother has something against you. Leave your altar. Leave your gift before the altar and go your way First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So the, the statement that can be made is, what is more important than worshiping God? 
being reconciled to the people around you. Are you hearing that? Yeah, he wants you to worship him. Yes, he wants you to be here. We're supposed to come and gather together. But that we cannot elevate that, and that cannot be a whitewash. Well, I know, I know, we've been fighting for 15 years. What? Really? You can't fight if one person decides not to fight. Well, but pastor, you don't know my brother, you don't know my father, you don't know my aunt, you don't, I don't have to. You know why? It's really cool. I know him. And I know that if you went before him and said, Lord, you're convicting me that I've got this problem and I need to take care of it. Will you, will you help me take care of this? How many of you know that, that you know that's a prayer he will answer? He will answer that prayer. Now, you're not responsible for the response that people bring to you based on you trying to do, do the right thing. You, you come back, you know, next week you come in here and you stand there, you got this big old scowl on your face, you're standing in the corner, you're mad at the pastor. I said, what's wrong? Well, I, you, I heard what you said last, last Sunday, Pastor, and I, I did it. I did what you said. And they acted ugly. And? Well, but they acted ugly. Okay. Did you do what you were supposed to do? Uh-huh. So you stand before God based on what? How they reacted? You mean to tell me that we, we tell our children, no, no, honey, you don't, you don't act just because of what people do. You don't, you don't respond to them that way. You don't react that way. Well, okay, adults, same way. We don't, I don't care what they do. You have a responsibility to be clean before them, be honest before them, keep your heart right. How many of you? I think, I think right now, in fact, as I'm saying this to you, I believe there's some people here today that God's already working on you. He's already popped somebody, somebody's face. It made, you, it made you jump out of that chair. You went, oh. Oh, Lord, not him, not her, anybody but them, Lord, right? What Paul was reaching for was when he described the first spiritual training program. There's a physical training program and a spiritual tra pr training program in the Bible. Herein do I exercise myself. He said, I exercise, this is my exercise, this is, this is my pumping of the weights, okay? I'm exercising myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. That's important. That's important. All of our good works, all of our sacrifices, all these things mean nothing to the Lord as long as we have a guilty conscience about having done something wrong to someone. You know, I, 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 I think the Lord needs to help us. Look, we believe in forgiveness. We believe in forgiveness, and we need to forgive those who've sinned against us because of mercy. You know, I don't know what your situation might be. It might be something that where you need to go and say, would you forgive me for the way that I asked, act towards you? I've asked, asked my children. I've stopped my children and said, will you forgive me for the way that I handled you in that situation? Because I was wrong, and God convicted me over that. We have to under have that kind of thing working inside of us, okay? So now, we not only, let me work this down now. Not only do we seek to be reconciled with others, but peacemakers, if you're going to elevate now, let's get in the elevator, okay? First floor elevator, that's fine. Oh, second floor? Okay. Lord's working on us. Let's punch, the, let's punch the button again. Let's go a little bit higher. He says, now, he says, we need to seek to help others reconcile. When a peacemaker is also aware of situations around where we could be the people that bring peace into a situation. That's what the Apostle Paul came into when he was, he was talking to the, to the church of Philippi was on the eastern coast of, of Greece. And, and Paul had worked in and out of that church on many occasions. He knew about the people that were working, working in there, and he heard that, that a certain Udio, Yodia and, and Sintichi, they, they were two ladies that were in that church. They were having it, having at it. And so he says, he says, I implore these two ladies to be of the same mind in the Lord. He was telling the, the leadership of that church, tell those ladies to get the, their act together. He, in other words, he was seeking to reconcile inside their lives the things that they needed to be doing and working in them. I urge you also as true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel. Help them. 
So there are times when you're going to go as a peacemaker and you're going to know in your family, in your, in your work situation, maybe it's a work situation between boss and somebody else that's there and, and you could be the one that could be in there to, to help that person to understand maybe what the boss is doing. I don't know what it might be. But as peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be the, the sons of God. The, uh, when we left here, the, it was the day after Labor Day when we drove out of town. And uh, as we were driving out, our, our first stop was going to be Oklahoma City. I felt that there was something the Lord was going to do inside of us, work on us about some things. Do you know the Lord's always working on us? Oh, yeah. Do you know it's not always pleasant? Oh, yeah. Not, not, it's, not a, it's not a hammer all the time, but there's just sometimes. Sometimes the Lord is going to work on you, and you're not going to like it. But he's going to use it to build something inside of you. And the Lord started working on me that he was going to bring us into situations where my natural reaction would be to want to complain or want to report. Come on. I want to talk to, can I talk to your manager? Can I do this? I can do that, all this stuff. And the Lord says, this is what you're going to do. This whole trip. You're going to keep a smile on your face, and if you have to bring an observation about something, you're going to say these two statements first. Number one, I'm not here to complain. Number two, I don't want anything from you. Now, when you go to somebody that's in a service industry, whatever it might be, and you say those two things, well, it helps them. Why? Because the very fact that you've come to them, they already have, they've already bristled. They're already working up all of their reasons why they didn't do anything wrong, right? So when you make those statements, it kind of takes them off guard. Just, just settles things. And oh, did we get tested. One that I can't even share with you how bad it was. I can't even tell you across the pulpit how bad it was. And what was cool about it was when it happened, I just, st I stepped, we were in a hotel. I stepped out in the hallway. I said, uh-uh. <laughs> I know what you're doing. Really. I went up to the desk, and I said those two things with a smile on my face. We're, it's 1030 at night. We're tired. It's 1030 at night. And I said, um, I'm not only here to make an observation. I said, I'm not, not complaining, just an observation. And I said, and also, I don't want anything from you. Well, after we worked through the whole situation, this, this guy, this, this desk clerk was, uh, well, how about, can I give you this? And I, gave, I said, no. Well, why don't you just take it? Uh -uh. No. What I was getting from the Lord was infinitely more important than what he was trying to give me. I was not going to let the little things that he was going to give me take rob me from the experience that we were going through. And if I express the experience to you, many of you, and the reason I won't tell you about it is because you would you'd feel mad at me. You'd say, I know what I would do. Well, God bless you. Just Take your little pride thing down the road. You're better than me. I just agree. I'll, I'll just agree right now. You're better than I am. It was, it was a deal that God was working on me. And I, I want to tell you, for us to be peacemakers, you have to walk into situations as a peacemaker. If you're going into that situation, I have righteous indignation, and you are going to treat me right because I expect to be treated right. Do you know what day we're living in right now? That day is long gone. One, one thing is, and we saw it all the way up there and back, that these companies are, they're begging for people to work for them, and they're reaching for anybody. We, we went through a drive through in Ohio, and the lady that handed our stuff out of the window had to be at least 80 years old. And I mean it. And 
like this, I felt my, my heart went out to her. You know, A's your, and she wasn't in good health. You could tell she, she wasn't in good health, and you could also tell another thing. She didn't really want to be there. So she does something wrong, I'm going to make her a day. Lady! Oh, you all sitting, you all sitting real pretty out there. You, you're looking real, really spiritual out there. And I know you don't ever do things like that. No. We have a right to be treated the right way. No, we don't. In fact, let me preach to you sometime about that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Amen, Pentecostals. Let's get after it. Let's get the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Wait a minute. I want to go back to the first one. Let me camp out in the first one. No, I don't want to go to the second one. Being made conformable to his death. We pick and choose what kind of things we want to enjoy in the Lord. Fellowship is suffering. You know why? Because that teaches us how to humble ourselves to life itself. You're not that big. I'm not that big. We're not that important. We aren't to him. We are to him. But we need, the day that we're in right now, we need to make sure we, we understand how to go after the Lord the right way. I, I, want, I want to tell you something. Our trip, there was times... We, we had a wonderful time. I want to tell you something. These, these th- situations that we had were very few and far between. Okay, we had opportunities for um, just, just a lot of, we had birthday parties we went to and weddings we went to and driving here and driving there and seeing people. I saw a man that we had, pa- had pastored 35 years ago and had never, had, hadn't, hadn't seen him in 35 years, got to have lunch with him. And, and just, it's just a, just a wonderful time. The whole trip was powerful. But they're in, when you have life like that, in life like when we walk out these doors today, there's opportunities for hurts and disappointments and regrets. That's called life. That's called life. And this thing we call life happens to all of us all the time. And we have to understand that in those times, the Lord is going to help us, give us opportunities to be peacemakers. Let me close with this here this morning. Okay. Jesus had a friend called Lazarus, and Lazarus had some sisters. They all were followers. Jesus, Lazarus dies. The sisters call for Jesus. They actually get mad at him a little bit because he doesn't get there as soon as they want him to get there. But he gets there, and he, he calls. He stands the, at the tomb where Lazarus is, and he says, Lazarus, come forth! And he, out comes Lazarus. Well, he didn't come out walking. He had all the grave clothes wrapped all around him. He's doing this kind of stuff, all right? Hops all the way out to where he is. Now, Jesus says something that I want all of you to take into your heart right now. He turns to the crowd around him. He says, loose him. Loose him. And let him go free. You mean, Jesus couldn't have gone like this? Yeah. He could have spun Lazarus like a top. He could have gone, and the grave clothes could have been gone. The analogy is this. God gives life. His body brings freedom. The Lord... As you start working people in, and we start working people into relationship with God, He's going to breathe, breathe life into them. But we are, have been mandated by God to help people get set free. And one of the best ways you can do that is to be a peacemaker. To, to, con, to convey to people that there's things more important than just the material things of life. Come on, church. We are so caught up with materialism in the United States today, it's hard to see and hear from Jesus clearly. But he wants us. You've got neighbors, you've got co-workers, everybody, everybody. We've got family members. You've got family members that are lost, and, th- and you haven't talked to them in about four weeks, and the reason is because the last time you talked to them, they cussed you out. And I don't have to stand for that. And yes, you do. What? Yes, you do. Because you're going to call them back and say, hey, listen, last time we talked, I must have said something, and I'm sorry about that, whatever it was. 
would you forgive me? Because you know what? I like you. Not only that, I love you. And you're important in my life. And I don't ever want to hang up on a phone call like that. And I don't even know why I'm doing like this. I'm supposed to do like this, right? <laughs> oh, the day we're living in. <laughs> Got a block in my hand instead of... Some of you need to go to your boss tomorrow. Say, you know, would you forgive me for my attitude the past couple of weeks? I've stunk the place up with my attitude. And I want you to know that I'm here to make you successful. Pastor, you don't know my boss. I refer you back to what I said earlier. I know you're God. I can show you scripture that says you're supposed to treat that boss right no matter what he does. How he acts. How she acts. How he, they do. We're supposed to, and tell them, I'm here to make you, you successful. I'm here, I'm not going to do anything that's going to undermine you. I'm not going to do anything that's going to make you look bad. In fact, I'm going to do just the opposite. So what happened, what's the opposite? When you're out there, and now you're at the, around the, the water cooler, around the coffee pot, with all the rest of the workers, and they're going, and you get in there, come on, come on church. We do that when we ought to be there saying, well, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. You remember he just told us three days ago that his wife has left him? Oh, yeah, that's right. So what would, what would you do right now if your wife had left you? Well, I'd be feeling pretty bad. Well, I know that's a small example. I'm just talking about peacemakers have discernment about them. They have intention intentionality about them, they want to do what's necessary to do the, the mandate that God's given us. I want to be called a son of God. I want, and he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in just a minute, before you do. If the Lord has talked to you at all, maybe brought the face of somebody, brought an idea, a thought, some, some situation that you know about inside your personal life. Well, we're going to pray about these things in just a minute. I want you to take that thing specifically. Not just a general thing. Well, God, help me to be more peaceful. Da, 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 da. No, Lord, help me with this person. Give me the right package, the right way, whatever it is, Lord, the right words to say. Lord, help them to call me. Lord, you make the connection. It, it, help us get this thing together to make the connection. Because I want to be right with you, Lord. I want to be right. Let's close our eyes right now. Lord, I think you're at work right now, God. I thank you. And Jesus, I want my heart right. I don't want anything between me and you and between me and anybody else on this earth, God. Because every one of these people are your creation too. And I need to handle them with dignity and with care. I need to be right before you, Lord God. And I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me, first and foremost, for, for forgiving me, for not being more merciful, for me not being more attendant to your spirit, Jesus, what you've been trying to do inside of me. God, help me. Help me, Lord Jesus, to repair this relationship in order to give you glory. And God, I don't ask for a good response from them. I'm saying, Lord, no matter what their response is, you help me to be the bigger person because I'm filled with your spirit. I know it's right. I know it's right. Everybody said in Jesus' name. So here's what you're going to do.